Hey, Sociology 101. So um, the reason this one is coming or this lecture is coming slightly late is because I'm still deciding how to kind of frame the lecture. Um, so we're talking about social stratification in the United States. So we're going to be talking about how um, we're stratified along different levels in the United States, specifically types of inequality. So the first one, obviously, which is going to be covered in this lecture, we're going to be going over economic inequality and uh, class, the class system, um, which your book focuses on. However, this week, you will also notice that we are going to cover race, ethnicity, sex, um, gender, sexual orientation, as well as age and aging and the elderly, sorry. Um, so those are also types of inequality and in how we are set up in the United States. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to probably separate this into three lectures just because it's so intense. So this lecture is just gonna cover chapter nine. So we are going over social stratification in the United States, but the following lectures will cover types of inequality, which are also ways that we are stratified in the United States. Sound good? So for this, we are going to dive into chapter nine. As I said, some of these lectures, a lot of them now are going to be covered on the exam. So it is up to you. I am not a parent. I cannot force you to watch or listen these, to these lectures. However, if you do want to get a good grade in this class, you will listen to these lectures. So let's get into it. Let me share my screen with you guys. And we can begin. So we are covering a section on social stratification in the United States. This is chapter nine, um, specifically for this lecture in this week. So the first part of this lecture in this week, okay? Um, so this house, formerly owned by a famous television producer, Aaron Spelling, was for a, for a time listed for $150 million. It is considered one of the most extravagant homes in the United States and is a testament to wealth generated in some industries. This specifically the movie and the um, entertainment industry, Aaron Spelling, okay? Um, I believe the producer of 90210, when I was growing up, that was my show, the original 90210, okay? Again, as usual, figures are important. Okay, what does this home tell you in the United States, tell you about the United States? What does your home tell you about the United States? Because a lot of us are living in different conditions, okay? My home looks nothing like that. Does this home illustrate a man, or if it's a mansion of any kind, does it illustrate that those people have worked harder than my parents, than your parents? What does it mean? What does having a house like this mean to you? Okay, so keep that in mind. Okay, here's another figure from our chapter. Okay, in the upper echelons of the working world, people with the most power reach the top. And we're talking in in sociology, whenever I mention power, and from this point over, this point on, whenever you hear sociologists mention power, we're not talking about like some kind of mystical thing. I'm talking about people. Sociologists are talking about people who have power economically, politically, and socially. So economically, their money talks. Politically, they can change laws and policies that affect not only them, but the rest of us. And socially, their words are heard. Whereas, I'm not saying that I can't get my voice out there. I'm saying because I am a nobody, okay? my voice can only go so far. Whereas some of your famous entertainers, your rappers, your political figures, 
people with money, their voices, socially, they can get their voices heard beyond any realms that I can get my voice heard. Get it? So that's what power means in sociology. You have power economic, you can move and shake things economically. You can move and shake things politically. You can move and shake things socially, okay? These people make the decisions and earn the most money. The majority of Americans will never see the view from the top. The majority of us, you and I, your parents, my parents, your grandparents, my grandparents, your friends, okay, your peers, many of us will never, okay, make it to the top. And that's not to say that you can't, okay? So please hear me clearly. I'm not saying that you can never make it to the top, but what data has shown us, what our current system has shown us is that those who have power economically, politically, and socially oftentimes will make it to the top, whereas many of us don't have these things and we'll never see the top, okay? That doesn't mean stop striving. Please continue to strive, okay? What do you think about this, okay? A lot of us have big hopes, big dreams, okay? But after reading this, and many of you probably have already gotten into this chapter, what do you think? Okay, because a lot of the things that we are talking about in chapter nine, the election, future elections, because these people are politicians, have power economically, politically, and socially. They can dictate our lives, but we elect these people, do not forget. Okay, what does all this mean? And how do you feel about it? Okay. So just to cover a couple of things that aren't necessarily covered in your book, but you should know them because they're going to show up on exams. Okay, systems of inequality, and we're talking about social stratification, we will get into that, but systems of inequality are human creations. So things such as racism, we created them. Things such as classes, we created them. And I'm not saying you literally, right? Because like, I haven't lived for generations, okay? Systems of sexism, homophobia, we created them. Systems such as ageism, okay? We created them. So systems of inequality are social constructs, okay? They're human creations. Okay, and oftentimes they're based on, not oftentimes, they're based on power. One segment of society always has the ability to set the standards of what is good or not within systems. Okay, and typically these standards are set by people who have power economically, politically, and socially. These people also have the power to marginalize or impose disadvantages on people who are looked at as bad or as abnormal or as other. Simply, again, going back to the last lecture, I don't actually have to do anything wrong in the United States, where I'm talking about the deviance chapter, deviance and crime. I don't have to do anything wrong in the United States for me to be labeled as deviant. I can simply be born black. I can simply be born poor. I can simply be born les a lesbian. I can simply be born disabled, okay? And based on the way that people in power define what is aesthetically pleasing, and what is not, what is good and what is not, and based on where I stand, I could be defined as abnormal or as bad and be marginalized because of that, okay? So when we talk, when we get into racism, right, it is 
a system that marginalizes people. Again, they're social constructs, okay? And I'm not saying that we created, we literally were at, in the United States during its founding and created racism, but we perpetuate it, okay? I'm not saying that you in this class who identify as poor or as working class, right, are bad or lazy. I don't define that, right? But there are people in power who really oftentimes state that because you don't work hard enough, you're in the condition that you are, okay? My dad works seven days a week, still to this day. I make more than my dad. All my siblings make more than my dad. He's the hardest working man I know, okay? But he barely makes over 50,000 a year. Okay. Now, what would you guys say about that, right? Is he not working hard enough? Because one thing I will say, my dad is a forklift driver and he's a farmer. Okay. He supplies food for the world. If that's not hardworking, what is? Okay. Seven days a week. Okay. And many people would still say, well, he's not working hard enough. If he just worked hard enough, he'd be better off. Okay. And we're going to get to um, status and consistency when it comes here. Because food is essential for everyone. And there are certain types of professions that work their butts off that don't see, that work their butts off and are also important for our survival as a nation, as a country, as a globe, and they don't see their just earnings. Farmers are one of them. For any of you who are in the classroom, some of you who might be in high school right now, I would also say ambulance workers are another. Okay. What else? Teachers now more days. I will tell you guys, it is a struggle to make sure these weeks get up on Blackboard. I'm tired, okay? But there's still a segment of society who will say and who will make the masses think that people like teachers or ambulance workers or farmers aren't working hard enough and that they're lazy. People participate in systems of inequality involuntarily. So, an uncom I wish this class was face to face. I wish, okay? Because it's hard to, and I'm just assuming right now because I'm talking to a computer screen, but talking about inequality in a class is a beautiful thing because you can see students really struggle with it because I will not say that we are class, like I'm not gonna call anyone a classist here. I'm not gonna call anyone a racist, a sexist, a homophobe, etc. But I will say that each and every single one of us participates in those systems involuntarily all the time, okay? And it's like the bystander effect. So I'm gonna give you an example right now. The bystander effect. Remember, bullying is a big issue in the United States. And I think bullying, a lot of people would say, bullying, huh, I've dealt with that. I've dealt with bullying, definitely. But I would also say that bullying has evolved. When I was getting bullied, right? Yes, I got bullied. When I was getting bullied, um, the most people would do to me is call me names. On the verge of harassment, I would say, right? But call me names. Today you have students 
who experience bullying um, through things like students putting like cigarette buds on their skin, um, harassing them, not just in school, but online, um, threatening their livelihoods, et cetera. So it's definitely upgraded. Okay, we've gotten creative with it, but it's like the bystander effect. If I don't try to resolve the situation, then I'm part of the problem. So for instance, I'm seeing John get bullied every single day at school, and I know it's wrong. John needs a buddy and I should stick up for him, but I don't. Then you're a part of the problem. So we participate in systems of inequality all the time involuntarily, okay? So for instance, you see someone harassing a poor person on the street, a homeless person on the street, you know it's wrong. Someone kicks over their chain, their cup of quarters and you don't say anything, but you pretend you haven't seen it. You're part of the problem. You see a student getting harassed because of their um, religious attire and you don't say anything. You're part of the problem. You see somebody getting picked on because of their race and you don't say anything. You're part of the problem, okay? That's what I mean. So we all participate in these things, regardless of who we are, okay? What are systems of inequality? In the United States, many people are treated as subordinate or inferior on the basis of their class, race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, age, ability, or lack of, amongst many other things. These individuals can also be subject to discriminatory treatment by others. What we aim to do as sociologists is to analyze society in terms of social stratification. So to look at society in terms of these layers, okay? Here's another figure from your chapter. Strata in a rock illustrates social stratification. So I, I'm pointing to the screen like you guys can do it, like see it. Um, but if you notice the layers, so the strata in the rock, right? People are sorted and layered into social categories. Many factors determine a person's social standing, such as income, education, occupation, as well as age, race, gender, and even physical abilities, okay? So for instance, how are we stratified, okay? Socially stratified based on income. Well, we have an upper class, we have a middle class, and we have a lower class. That's how we're stratified. How are we stratified based on race, okay? Whites, and we're using history here, okay? Whites are usually at the top, Asian and Pacific Islander, Black and Hispanic today, I would say, are here. And Hispanic is not a race, okay? But it used to be. So Black, Blacks, okay, and then American Indians and Natives, okay? Physical ability, those who are able-bodied, those who are not, okay? Let's do gender, men, women, and anybody who defines themselves as other. Let's do age, okay? Age is hard to do, but will I say that elderly people face ageism? Yes. So elderly are down here. However, when it comes to different types of circumstances, such as this political election that we're going to go through, maybe the elderly would be up here, okay? But do you get it? In the United States, people like to believe everyone has an equal chance of success. 
or at success. We also emphasize self-effort that perpetuates the belief that people can control their own social standing. Okay. However, again, as sociologists, we recognize that social stratification is a society-wide system that makes inequalities apparent. While there are always inequalities between individuals, sociologists are interested in larger social patterns. Stratification is not about individual inequalities, but about systematic inequalities based on group membership, classes, and the like. No individual, rich or poor, can be blamed for social inequalities. The structure of society affects pers a person's social standing, okay? So here we're blaming the structure, okay? I do wanna emphasize before I go on, it is crucial if you do not know the difference between the functionalist conflict and symbolic interactionist perspective, you need to get it down now, okay? You need to get it down now. And I'll explain why in just a few moments. Although individuals may support a f or fight inequalities, social stratification is created and supported by society as a whole. Again, we, systems, inequalities, structures, need people, need us to believe in them, to operate in them, and to support them for them to continue to exist, okay? Involuntarily or not, okay? So there are certain types of inequality. We might, as a sociologist, I do remain optimistic, okay? Not all sociologists, okay? Because some sociologists are very functional in that, again, functionalism, in that people are flawed. The system is never wrong. The system is always right. Okay, the system is not flawed, you are. Okay, but these structures, these inequalities, the way things are set up and stratified in society is because we allow them to continue some of us agree with them, and some of us don't agree with them, but we never open our mouths, okay? Another figure from chapter nine, the people who live in this, these houses most likely share similar levels of income and education. Neighborhoods often house people of the same social standing. Wealthy families do not typically live next door to poorer families though this varies depending on the particular um, city or the country, okay? So if any of you have ever been to Lawrence, and what's the town like right over? Andover, okay? There, you can see like at the line, right? You can definitely see I don't want to call them poor families, but there are poorer or less, let's say working class families who are next to more middle and upper class families, okay? We see these drastic, the drastic differences in social standings when it comes to housing, especially in poorer countries. If you go to places like where my family is from, okay, Haiti, you can see a mansion right next to Ashanti house, right? Which is just a little kind of um, cement kind of like house. You can see this in Kenya. You can see this in Brazil, okay? You can definitely see these also in the United States in different Western worlds or first, um, not first worlds, but core countries. Remember, you can see them in core countries, but it's not as in your face. They're more subtle, okay? So let's get into it, what this chapter is all about. Social stratification. 
Social stratification refers to a society's categorization of its people into rankings of socioeconomic tiers based on factors like wealth, income, race, education, and power. Remember, social stratification is multidimensional. Okay, so Max Weber, again, chapter one, chapter three. Max Weber, again, in conversation with Karl Marx, says that stratification does not just occur along economic lines, but stratification and the way that we are layered and the way that we are organized in society can happen and occur based on race, based on political affiliation, based on gender, based on disability or ability, et cetera, okay? Systems of inequality are sets of social relationships built around an attribute such as wealth, race, sexual orientation to which members of society, us, accord a great meaning and importance in everyday life. In the United States, we specifically focus on these six. It's not to say that there aren't more, but these six are in your face constantly. So economic inequality, racial inequality, gender inequality, age inequality, inequality based on sexual orientation, and inequality based on able-bodiedness. So for this lecture, we're going into economic inequality. And we're going to be talking about class and the caste system for this. And then we will move on to the next for um, the other lecture or the other lectures. Okay. So here, another figure from um, chapter nine. India used to have a rigid caste system. The people in the lower caste suffered from extreme poverty and were shunned by society. Some aspects of India's dysfunct caste system remain socially relevant. In this photo, an Indian woman of a specific Hindu caste works in construction and she demolishes and builds houses. Okay. So we're going to go into a short discussion about caste systems. Okay. In the United States, we don't have a caste system. Okay. We don't have this rigid system where people don't have mobility to climb up and down the economic ladder. Let's move forward. Okay. So the caste system. A caste system is one in which people are born into their social standing and will remain in it their entire lives, okay? People are assigned occupations regardless of their talents, their skills, their interests, or even their potential. There are virtually no opportunities to improve a person's social position. In the Hindu caste tradition, people were expected to work in the occupation of their caste and to enter into marriage according to their caste. Accepting this social standing was and is in places that still occupy and hold dear the caste system considered a moral duty. Cultural values reinforced this system. Caste systems promote beliefs in faith, destiny, and the will of a higher power rather than promoting individual freedom as a value. A person who lived in a caste society was socialized to accept his or her specific standing. Now, India used to have this caste system, okay? Um, and I forget, and I do not want to state because it's not, like I don't want to state non-actual facts in this, but um, there are more than three levels of the Indian caste or were of the Indian caste system. And again, you had to marry into the same the caste system that you were born into. You had to marry into that same caste system, okay? Again, regardless of your talents, your skill, your interest and your potential, you still could not move out of that caste system, okay? Whereas it's different for us in the United States, for us, in most Western countries, 
right? Where we don't have a caste system. We don't have a system that's rigid, okay? We have the opportunity, okay? The opportunity to move out of our caste system. What are some of the ways that we can move out of our caste system? Okay. We can get, we can build skill, build on skills, build on talents, build on our, our educational attainment, mayoring, et cetera. Okay. So the caste system, um, you don't find it in many places around the world. However, there are some countries which still utilize the caste system today. economic inequality and the class system, okay? So our system. So economic inequality is defined as a system of inequality characterized by a vast difference in wealth and income possessed by families and individuals. In the United States today, wealthy, in the United States today, wealth and income are unequally distributed. This distribution has become ex extremely clear as a result of the Great Recession that rocked our nation's economy in the last few years. I would even go further to say it because we are living in a recession today, if you guys didn't know, okay? We're living in another recession today. People still have not gotten over the 2008 recession, and we are currently being rocked by a recession in 2020. Okay, so if it wasn't extremely clear in 2008, and I know a lot of you are very, very young, but you can ask your parents, okay? If it wasn't clear back then, today, and I'm expecting in January, we will definitely see how clearly divided economically we really are. Okay, and I'm not talking about divided like, um, again, we can't in sociology. It's not our fault that we are in the conditions that we are in. Yes, if some of you read The Homeless, right? There are people that definitely, it's very few. I don't know anybody who chooses to become homeless. A lot of the people that I know are hard workers, so hard. And I told you guys about my dad. Okay, so hard, but still the way that certain structures and systems are set up in society, these individuals will still never make it. Yeah, I'm a professor. Yeah, I get paid a decent amount, right? Would I say it's fair? I work at a community college, it's not that fair, right? But, The amount of work I'm doing, especially now, to the point where I'm in tears almost every single day, and this is not even a lie. It's a lot. It's a lot. Do I feel I'm underpaid? Yeah. However, I also feel 2020, I'm very fortunate to even have a job. Okay. But I feel like in January, we will see exactly how crazy income inequality, economic inequality is in the United States. For those of you who own a home, this may not affect you so bad. And when I say own a home, I'm saying about own the home. There is no mortgage on the home. I would say you're okay. You're okay. You're okay for now. I'm lucky my parents own this home. There's no mortgage. There's no mortgage. Okay. But I know that there are people that do not own their homes and have not paid their mortgages. They will be out on the streets very, very soon. Okay. But again, we participate involuntarily in these systems, whether that be a lack of education around, you know, economic inequality in the United States, or you do have that 
you know, um, education. We perpetuate these systems. We put into political positions people that are supposed to talk for us, right? And they're supposed to make things fair. But it's also up to you to be aware of what you are doing, okay? If you don't say anything, you're part of the problem. If you do say something, you're not part of the problem. But you need more people to help you, okay? In the United States, a small portion of the population has the means to the highest standard of living, okay? Your book goes over standard of living. And I will go over that furthermore in different like in a lecture this week but later on but standard of living is the level of wealth available to certain socioeconomic classes in order to acquire material necessities and comforts to maintain a lifestyle okay wealthy people receive the most and the best schooling and have better health care and consume the most goods and services okay Many view um, the United States as a middle-class society, but is this a myth, okay? And I have linked um, a study here, and I actually might give you this PowerPoint slide. I think I'm gonna give you guys this PowerPoint slide. I should upload this by Wednesday. I want you guys to view this research. Many people view us as a middle-class society. What do you think? Okay, again, I do think that 2020 will show us what kind of society 2020 is. And again, last lecture, like I kind of had like this brain moment where literally all the theorists that we've gone over are at play today. And it is wild. Again, their predictions, I've seen them happen, you know, little moments in my life, you know, protests here, protests there, but not all at once. This is nuts. This is nuts, okay? But I will upload this um, lecture for you guys to see. Barely 10 years passed since the end of the Great Recession in 2009. The U.S. economy is doing well on several fronts, or was. Okay, so this slide was made before we went into the recession. I'm so sorry, guys. Okay, the labor market is on the jo job creating streak that has rung up more than 110 months straight of employment growth, a record for the post World War II era. The unemployment rate in November of 2019 was 3.5, a level not seen since the 1960s. Gains on the job front are also reflected in household incomes, which have rebounded in several years. But not all economic indicators appear promising. Household incomes have grown only modestly in this century, and household wealth has not returned to its pre-recession level. Economic inequality, whether measured through the gaps in income or wealth between richer and poorer households, continues to widen. Okay, so I'm gonna give you guys a slide. I do want you guys to click on the PowerPoint and you know, formulate your own opinion, please. Okay, do your own resources. You guys have come from high school. You guys have had some great um, English and literature professors who have taught you or should have taught you how to find valid and credible sources. Okay, do your own research. But I'm gonna give you guys a slide as well. So what's a class system, our system that we have here in the United States and that other, many other Western worlds have? A class system is based on both social factors and individual achievement. A class consists of people who share similar status with regard to factors like wealth, income, education, and occupation. Unlike class caste systems, class systems are open. People are free to gain a different level of education, employment, other than their, what their parents have had. They can also socialize with and marry members of other classes, which allows people to move from one class to another. 
In class systems, people have the option to form exogamous marriages, unions of spouses from different social categories. So you can marry up, you can also marry down, but you can move, okay? You can move out of your class system through marriage, okay? Marriage to a partner from the same social background is an endogamous marriage or an endogamous union. Okay. Here, this is an example of an exogamous marriage. So here we have, um, and your, I don't know why this is cut off, but in your book, you have the full picture of um, Prince William and also Catherine Middleton. Again, the Duke of Cambridge and the commoner. Okay, so Prince William, Duke of Cambridge, who was in line to be King of England, married Catherine Middleton, a so-called commoner, an everyday girl, meaning she doesn't have royal ancestry. Also meaning that he married someone not within his social standing, okay? So the class system offers opportunities through marriage, through education, through occupation, to move. It's not rigid like the class, the caste system. Okay. The next couple of things I want to go over, and this is how I'm going to end this lecture. Again, there is much more to chapter nine. Okay, class traits, um, global stratification, etc. Make sure you guys go over that. The last thing I want to cover in this specific lecture is perspectives on economic inequality, okay? And I'm going to use some examples. So look, I'm going to go over the functionalist, I'm going to go over the conflict, and then I'm going to go over the um, symbolic interactionist. And then I'll pick up in the second part. So perspectives on economic inequality from the functionalist perspective, also known as structural functionalism. Okay, this perspective believes that economic inequality is beneficial to society. Different aspects of society exist because they serve a needed person. Now, in exam one, many of you guys, and I'm going to be honest, you need to read. Many of you guys got the Hurricane Maria question wrong. Okay. However, some of you answered this question wonderfully, okay? So there were some of you who talked about how the functionalist perspective sees um, society or sees structures in society as having and serving different purposes. All of these parts work together because they are needed like an organism, okay? So when it comes to the functionalist perspective, looking at economic inequality, economic inequality serves a purpose, okay? Let's look at an, exa at an example, okay? It's not bad that a CEO gets paid $400,000 a day. Different jobs, different pay, different rewards. This should actually keep people striving for more and bettering themselves. These highly rewarded positions are the most beneficial for society anyways. It's important that those who are skilled take the most rewarded positions because they can do those jobs. Therefore, maintaining an ongoing system of economic inequality is necessary and inevitable. That's the functionalist perspective. I want you to sit back and think about that, okay? CEO getting paid $400,000 a day, okay? If you need an example, look at Walmart, okay? Look at Amazon, look at Apple, et cetera, okay? These CEOs are getting paid billions, millions, okay? You as an individual should, from the functionalist perspective, somebody looking, using the functionalist lens will say you should look up to those people you are looking up to those people you should be striving to be just as successful economically successful as these people 
you know, Jeff Bezos, okay, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, okay, those people, they're highly skilled. They deserve and they, you know, those are the most rewarded positions in society anyways. They can do those jobs. Okay, but the functionalist is also going to say that that person, I'm just going to use Jeff Bezos, right? That person driving that Amazon truck is also very important. Okay, but that person driving that truck doesn't have to stay there. They could look up to Jeff Bezos and they can move up the economic ladder, go through more schooling. You know, work your way up the Amazon chain. Eventually, you might not take over the company, but you could be close to the top. Do you guys see anything wrong with this perspective? Do you see anything wrong with this perspective? If not, here, let me tell you, because I don't have students in front of me, okay? I do have an issue with someone saying, or the functionalist per se, perspective saying that these highly rewarded positions are the most beneficial for society. I'm not saying that they're not, but there are others. There are others. Think of certain occupations that if they were not in existence right now in 2020, we kind of be screwed. We would be screwed. Do those people get their fair share? Okay, and I have given you guys examples. Farmers, CNAs, teachers, people who work on the ambulance, on ambulances, et cetera. Okay. Now, if farmers were all of a sudden to stop farming and producing in the United States, what do you think would happen? I can tell you what would happen too, because we've had instances of them in the United States. So when I was in California, um, Arizona passed this law called SB 1040 or SB 1070. You can Google it. Okay. I was in California from 2008 to 2010, 2008 to 2011. Okay. So, as law, they, Arizona passed a law SB 10, 1070. This law made it legal for, um, any officer, any teacher, anyone to pretty much call the police on anyone who looked like they were from Mexico or a Spanish speaking country. Okay. One of the biggest hit industries was the farming industry. Okay. And I will tell you in the United States, we have a lot of people who tend to our soil who grow our crops that aren't from the United States, that aren't from the United States. My dad was one of them, okay? And whether or not you agree with the immigration or not, this specific law showed us, in Arizona specifically, and then it went to Texas, showed us that if we put this policy in place, which Arizona did, which Texas did, then there would be a serious crop drought and not because of the environment, because there were not enough people who wanted, who wanted to farm in the United States. People set out initiatives to get college students, to get high school students to work on farms. And if any of you have ever worked on a farm, because my dad works on a farm, I've been on one, it's hard. <laughs> it's so hard. It's so hard. It's not just like playing with animals all day. 
like you will become elderly very soon, like give it a week. And that's exactly what they saw. That's exactly what they saw. And you know what happened? Food prices went up. So you know what people started doing? Oh, hell no. Oh, hell no. This can't be. No, 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 no. I do not want to pay like, and it's an exaggeration, but $10 for an orange. Okay. So just think about that. Think about that. So I'm not saying, again, just <laughs> I'm not saying that people like Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates don't deserve the money that they do. They have created jobs. They do deserve that. But there are many other individuals in this world who have some beneficial jobs in society that without them, if these people stopped working, we would all be, we all of us would go nuts in the United States. Okay. That's the functionalist perspective. Functionalist is very black and white. We're going to talk about other types of inequality when it comes to the functionalist perspective, and it's not going to be nice. Again, you will notice that functionalists, again, there are certain things that I agree with when it comes to functionalism, but I don't agree with gender inequality when it comes to functionalism, racial inequality when it comes to functional. Think about racial inequality when it comes to functionalism, right? Would a functionalist say racism is beneficial to society? Yes. Sexism is beneficial to society? Yes. Homophobia is beneficial to society. Yes. That's where it becomes messed up. Economic inequality is messed up enough. But let's move on before I get hype. Okay. Continuing on with the functionalist perspective, this perspective posits that social stratification represents the inherently unequal value of different work. In other words, certain tasks in society are more valuable than others. And qualified people who fill those positions must be rewarded more so than others. What do you think? Okay. We also have, let me stop sharing quickly. We also have the conflict perspective. Let me just, there it is. share screen. Sorry, guys. We also have the conflict perspective, okay, when it comes to economic inequality. The conflict perspective, when it comes to economic inequality, these individuals state that it's dysfunctional and harmful. It only benefits some people and not all of society. Economic stratification perpetuates inequality. So for example, this perspective would emphasize the importance at looking at power, again, power economically, socially, and politically, looking at privilege, and looking at capitalism. In the United States, the ownership of society's means of production is typically in the private hands of a small proportion of the population. This small proportion of the population makes the big decisions as to who how and where people will be hired. They keep the wages low, keep the profits up of the top of the, keep the profits up and the incomes up of the top executives. Inequality is fostered by capitalism and largely benefits those who disproportionately receive the benefits, those who own the means of production, not you. What do you think about this? Okay. Now, yeah, what do you think about this? So the functionalist perspective is going to say economic inequality is beneficial. The, the conflict perspective is going to see, say that it's not beneficial. It perpetuates inequality. So Jeff Bezos is going to continue to make the big decisions as to who, how, and where people will be hired. He's going to keep, you know, the Amazon drivers, the Amazon factory workers. He's going to keep their wages low, 
but keep his profits up. And anybody who was beneath him, so his, you know, VP, his um, managers, he's going to keep their incomes up, his executives up. Okay, so economic inequality really doesn't benefit, benefit the man, the common man, us and you. What do you think? Okay. And then symbolic interactionism. So this is the micro level, okay? So this is just looking at your everyday life. Whereas the functionalists in conflict, we're looking more outward. We're looking beyond ourselves. We're looking at systems and structures. Symbolic interactionism, micro. We're looking at ourselves, our neighborhood at town. So here, people's appearance, think of symbols and their meanings, reflect their perceived social standing. Housing, clothing, and transportation indicate social status as do hairstyles, taste, and accessories and personal style. How does your, sorry, how does your social standing affect your everyday interactions? So how does the way you dress, how, the things that you can control, right? Your dress, your housing, your clothing, and I'm not gonna say you can con control them completely, right? But how does that affect or influence whether or not you get a certain position, okay? Does that influence your economic, does your clothing, can your, can your clothing influence your economic status? Can your hair influence your economic status, okay? For some of us, again, some of us might be like, no, 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 okay? But I urge you to think about why are you saying no? And what is it about you that allows you to have that experience? So I'm not taking away from your experience at all, okay? Does my hair, did my hair, when I was in elementary school and middle school, did it influence my social standing? I will tell you, in Massachusetts, I got detention constantly for my hair. Okay, but some of you might have straight hair that naturally comes out of your hair straight. My hair comes out of my head and reaches the sun, okay? I can't control it, okay? But there are things that I can do, right? So I can dress, you know, dress based off the certain situation I'm going into, okay? Housing, I, I can control housing now. Transportation, I can control now, you know? So can these things, these things in our neighborhoods, in our realms, can they influence our economic growth or lack of? Think about it. Again, remember, we tend to interact with people who are, to, who are within our own social standings. Good? Okay. So, yes, I'm going to end with that today. With the second lecture, we're going to go into racial inequality. We're going to do the exact same thing. Ethnic inequality, we're going to do the exact same thing. Gender, exact same thing. So stay tuned for those, okay? So I will see you guys later. Have a good one.